In this episode, I will show you my secret tool for achieving perfect exposure, skin tones, and consistency in my photos. This tool is Omniscope, an application by Time and Pixels. This app analyzes your color edits, providing precision feedback based on average skin tones in a more technical way, saving you time and eliminating guesswork. It also works for video and integrates with a plugin on apps like DaVinci Resolve, Scratch, Premiere Pro, After Effects, Adobe Photoshop, and Lightroom. However, you can use it with any editor not on the list, like Capture One and Affinity Photo, via screen capture mode. This is a paid software, but there is a demo version you can use to follow along. If there is a discount code available, you'll find it in the description. For photographers or videographers beginning their careers in color correction and grading, Omniscope can be an essential learning tool for recognizing correct exposure and skin tones. Not only does it help you edit more confidently, but it ensures consistency across your media before applying a color grade. It's time to evolve your workflow. I'm using Capture One as my raw editor, but this works with any photo editor and for any image type. This is a photo from a series of photos taken at a wedding anniversary. Here's an outline of my workflow. While monitoring with Omniscope, I will start with broad adjustments to the exposure and white balance, creating a solid foundation for the image. Next, I'll use hue adjustments to fine tune the skin tone, making it appear natural and healthy. This process essentially normalizes the image, meaning bringing it to a neutral starting point before color grading can be applied for a specific look. Lastly, I'll use that photo as a reference for the remaining photos in the series. As a public service announcement, if you are doing any kind of color work, at some point in your career, you may want to consider calibrating your screen. Also, while Omniscope does have a mode that lets you open an image and analyze it, we're interested in its live screen capture mode. With the image loaded and ready for processing, I'll run Omniscope and select Screen Capture. You'll see some default scopes. If you're using an Omniscope plugin supported editor, run it now. Normally, the workflow I'm showing you uses two monitors, but I've organized this workflow for single monitor use. The trial mode lets you run Omniscope indefinitely, but in three minute intervals. Just close and reopen it. If you're already an Omniscope user and have scopes loaded, save the layout by clicking Layout on the menu bar, then choose Save Layout As, and enter a name. Either way, close all the scopes, as we're going to create a new layout from scratch. Right-click in the UI window and select Scope. The three scopes we're going to use are the False Color, Vector Scope, and Skin Tone Scopes. I will add one scope at a time, then adjust each of the scope settings after. The other scopes will be explained on another episode, or you can visit the Time and Pixels website for information about each scope. I'll add the false color scope and place it on the left side of the screen using the panel indicators. Then I'll add a skin tone scope and place it underneath the false color scope. Lastly, I'll add a vector scope and position it on the right. You can adjust the panel proportions to your liking, then save the layout for future use. If you use a dual monitor setup, open the image on your main monitor and Omniscope on the second. For a single monitor setup, tile the windows to keep the subject in the photo and the Omniscope panels visible. On the Omniscope menu bar, select View, then make sure Stay on Top is checked. This will keep Omniscope in the foreground while editing. Let's adjust each scope settings. I will only go over the necessary settings of each scope to get you up and running. On the false color scope, indicated by the label tag, right click and select presets. I use the Atomos preset as it's popular for videographers and photographers using Atomos monitors. For the vector scope, the stock settings are sufficient. For the skin tone scope, right click and choose settings. Set model to HSL if it isn't already. This model is for intuitive view changes. YCBCR targets luminance and color difference components for broadcast standards. It's a good idea to test both models out. For now, let's use HSL. The rest of the settings will be important at a later stage. Now close the dialog. While editing our photos, we will use these scopes to help guide our color correction decisions. 
I want to mention that the capture mode for Omniscope captures the entire screen, including the window border and taskbar, and doesn't port the image from within the editing program unless you're using one of the Omniscope plugin supported editors. First, I'll adjust exposure while referencing the false color scope. This tool works like a weather heat map, with red areas indicating overexposed elements and dark blue areas indicating underexposed elements. Ideally, for lighter skin tones under good lighting, using the Atomos preset, aim for peach and light gray on the face, which is about 60 to 70 IRE. Highlights can reach yellow at around 80 IRE. IRE stands for Institute of Radio Engineers. It's a unit of measure for video signal strength, but here it helps us to measure exposure. Adjust these values about 10 IRE lower for brown skin and 20 IRE lower for very dark skin, with highlights relative to those changes and no higher than 80 IRE. Remember, these are guidelines. IRE values will vary for skin tones under different lighting conditions. If you're unsure about target IRE levels, Search for similar looking photos with good exposure and use them as a reference. In this specific photo, I adjusted exposure to achieve subtle yellow highlights, balancing nicely with the image's dynamic range. Once exposure is set, we can move on to adjust the white balance. Let's add a white balance layer. Use the white balance and tint controls to get the image colors closer to what you saw when taking the photo. If you are unsure about the ideal white balance, use the white balance picker tool. Click on a white element in the photo, like the whites of someone's eyes, a piece of paper, or a white shirt. Once the white balance looks good, we're going to focus on skin tone using the vector scope. There are two ways to reference the skin. One is by zooming in to a portion of the skin, and the other is selecting a portion of the skin. Using the zooming in method first, I'll zoom in quite a bit so that the light peachy part of the face takes up the whole viewer. Usually you want a lighted region where the light hits the skin directly and isn't blown out. I'll explain how to interpret the selection in a moment, but for now, notice how the scope pattern appears. The other method of reference is by selection. This method is ideal for tracking changes in different regions of the skin. While zoomed out, with the mouse cursor hovering over either the false color or skin tone scopes, highlight a well-lit part of the skin on the subject's face by holding down the left-click mouse button and growing the selection by dragging and don't let go. Again, only observe how the scope pattern appears. Initially, we want to use the zooming in method. The way to interpret the vector scope with the selection made is by looking for a gradual skin colored pattern to appear near this line called the skin tone line. This is also called the eye line or flesh tone line. This line is commonly used as a guide for where skin tones lie under white light conditions to within 10 to 20 degrees. The reason the line is pointed along towards the red is due to white or neutral light interacting with the hemoglobin in red blood cells, which absorbs certain wavelengths of light and reflects others. This interaction gives all skin its natural reddish undertone. Patterns near the center of the vector scope are regions with less saturation, while patterns near the edge are regions of greater saturation. If you have a color grade or a color effect applied to the image already, this line would not be applicable. When zoomed out, don't worry if the pattern from your selection is a bit blurry or cloudy. You want to approximate the average to sit along this line. Remember, the screen capture is taking all colors on the screen into account, but the colors you want to pay attention to are just the ones associated with the skin, along or about this line. While referencing the vector scope, slightly adjust the white balance and tint again. Don't expect just the white balance and tint to get the skin tone perfectly aligned along the skin tone line. Realize, some skin tones are more olive or reddish than others, so your selection and the skin tone line will not align exactly. This is just a preliminary step as you only want your skin tone selection near the skin tone line. Zoom out to check your progress and select regions of the face to track the changes in the vector scope. You can also scroll the mouse wheel over the vector scope itself to zoom in and out. If you find the white balance and tint didn't improve the image, 
then undo the change. If it did help, then once the alignment is close and perhaps off by a few degrees, then this is where we fine tune the skin tone by applying a hue shift if necessary. Zoom back into your image if it isn't already. In your editor, apply hue shift as a layer. I'm going to apply a global hue shift. Adjusting it will cause the pattern in the vector scope to rotate either clockwise or counterclockwise. Notice as I move the hue shift slider, the pattern appears to rotate. The changes you make should be small. Make sure you zoom out and select a larger region of skin you're sampling to double check the changes you made fit the context. This process should be relatively quick. For this photo, I'll shift a few degrees towards the skin tone line. Then zoom out to see what the rest of the photo looks like. It should look good. If it does, then we can move on. If your skin target is off by a different polar pattern shift, then perhaps you need to pick a new white balance point and repeat the subsequent steps. If your scene had ambient light that contaminated the shot, you can use a color wheel to add the opposite color to offset it. For example, if you had an orange light cast on the scene, find orange on the color wheel, then look directly across and you'll see the opposite color is bluish teal. You would then push a bluish teal to your image globally or in the highlights, midtones, or shadows. I encourage you to research color correction in your free time. Once you have the skin tone where you want it, we can double check it with the skin tone scope and use the mapping it provides as a reference for achieving consistent skin tone across the entire face in all the other photos. First, we need to fine tune the settings for this scope. Right click on the skin tone scope and select settings. The sliders directly below the model indicate the bounds that adjust the skin tone selection. The default upper bound of 0.42 and lower bound of 0.7 are a good start for well-lit images. If you have a photo with different exposure or lighting conditions, these values may change. Try moving them around to see how the selection changes. Let's jump down to overlay mode. The drop-down list offers grid, solid color, gradient levels 2 and 3, and color 3. These are overlays for the selection you made and can be assigned a custom color. Grid places a colored grid over the selection, while solid color overlays a single color over the selection. Gradient 2 is a two-color gradient overlay. In my workflow, I use Gradient 3 because it helps me more accurately recognize skin tone variations across skin with a three-color gradient overlay. This is important to me when makeup is used. Additionally, it lets me more precisely track skin tone changes across similar faces in different photos of the same series. Lastly, Color 3 is a three-solid color overlay. For now, choose Gradient 3. Once you understand how this tool works, you can choose whatever overlay suits your needs. Notice the slight color changes across the cheeks and around the lips. Once I adjust this photo to taste, I would expect the mapping signature of an individual to look similar in subsequent photos. The RGB color matrix is for inputting custom RGB values to change the gradient colors. Unless you're trying to match the color gradients of skin checker tools from other developers, you can leave the section alone. To isolate the skin selection, go back up and check saturation and luminosity. These limits help fine tune the selection by excluding clothing, hair, and background and foreground elements. The top saturation slider excludes parts of the image with the least saturation as a high pass filter. Move it to the right before it starts deselecting skin for all individuals in the shot. The lower saturation slider excludes parts of the image with the greatest saturation as a low pass filter. Move it left before essential parts of the skin are deselected. On the luminosity sliders, the top slider excludes the darkest part of the image as a high pass filter. Move it right to clean up the remaining darker regions of the image. The bottom slider excludes the lightest parts of the image as a low pass filter. For well lit images, it's probably fine to leave alone unless you have a photo where the skin tones are exposed differently. In that case, you will have to adjust all the luminosity and saturation sliders appropriately. If some of the brightest parts of the face aren't selected, go back to the top saturation slider and decrease the selection by sliding to the left. Then go to the top luminosity slider and increase that selection by sliding to the right. You'll need to experiment with this selection tool to find what works best for you. As a side note, after color correcting an image, 
I might refine the skin tone selection, especially if I initially used a reference photo. This helps me to use the newly edited image as a reference for the rest of the series. Checking the gray background grays whatever tones are not selected. Checking Apply Mask applies a global mask that completely isolates the selection by concealing the rest of the image that isn't selected. The effectiveness and result of the global mask will differ from image to image. Transparency affects the opacity of the overlay. Low Pass applies a low pass filter to the selection. The colored mapping is showing high frequency information, such that the edges around the mapping appear sharp and noisy. What the low pass filter does is reduce the high frequency information in the selection, making the edges smoother. You can see the effect better with this picture. Hopefully this overview was helpful. If you find the global mask effective, you can set it quickly by right clicking in the skin tone panel and selecting apply mask. With all the technical part out of the way, our goal is making sure the skin mapping looks the same across multiple images. For my images and using the HSL model, I'm looking for a green to yellowish map that is mostly uniformly covering the skin. With gradient 3, if this map were too yellowish or red, it means I would need to shift the hue toward green. If the map is too green and disappearing from regions of skin where the mask is applied, then I would need to shift the hue toward red. Once the mapping looks good, you're basically done for that image. At this point, you can try out the gradient 2 overlay or other gradient maps for a different perspective. Also, try changing the model to YCBCR. The mapping color will change, but you may prefer this model. Most importantly, you need to pay attention to the picture itself and not rely entirely on just the scopes. With the photo adjusted to taste, you can copy and paste the adjustments to all the photos in the series. Then preview each photo with Omniscope and use the workflow outlined in this episode to match the exposure and skin tones quickly and accurately with confidence. Let me adjust the exposure for the next two pictures. This needs a little more exposure. This one needs a little less exposure. There. After you're done adjusting, you can then choose to apply a color grade or LUT. This workflow is very similar for video. I highly recommend searching for reference photos and using Omniscope to inspect how they differ from yours. Search for brightly and dimly lit photos from professional photographers and train yourself to recognize the target exposure and hue for different skin tones. This will help improve your confidence and the quality of the content you deliver. That concludes this episode. I showed you a step-by-step -step process using Omniscope to achieve perfect exposure, skin tones, and consistency in photo edits. I explained how to use the false color scope, vector scope, and skin tone scope, and walked you through their settings. I then demonstrated how to apply them to correct exposure and skin tone. This application has been my go-to image processing aid for almost a year, and I hope you find it as useful in your workflow as I do in mine. Again, if there is a discount at the time of watching this episode, you'll find a discount code and a link to the software in the description. If you have a question or a useful tip, be sure to leave it as a comment. As always, thank you for watching, and until next time, go capture that once-in-a-lifetime moment.